Felt this way. Give everyone a sense of stability, continuity. Nothing has changed. Not even me. Professor Xavier is a jerk! I'm a kid again, out of my depth, completely overwhelmed by everything here. And it isn't the Sidri or Sentinels or the Brood that surround me, it's the smaller pieces. Shards. Merry Christmas, sexy. Kitty! Of me. At least I hope I'm not late. Hi! It's possible that I'm late. Quite so. This children is Kitty Pride, who apparently feels the need to make a grand entrance. I'm sorry. I was busy remembering to put on all my clothes. <laughs> so gushingly glad you could join us. Miss Pride will be teaching advanced... It's great to see you. Theory, Sorry about the timing. Well Did I miss the sorting hat? Just got scintillating introduction speech. Even I was bored. Hey everybody, this is Perch. Uh, I'm joined again by Joe Corallo. How are you doing? I'm alright, how are you? I'm doing well. We, uh, we, we, we've we tackled a couple big comics and the, the, we were asked, I think, to take a look at the Joss Whedon masterpiece, Astonishing X-Men. Yes, uh, we, we were. Um, it was I, I forget who was the commenter, but someone commented on the uh, Death of Cap one because we started talking about it in the, in the Death of Cap uh, video. And it was like, yeah, no, makes sense. It does. And it was... Um, it was it was a fascinating point for Astonishing X-Men. And what I think and what I'm anxious to talk to you about is that there's a lot of, I don't want to say revisionist history, but uh, the way people look back at this time frame has altered a lot as the people have gone in and out of favor. Yes. And, and probably biggest at the center of that, you have Joss Whedon. And you were mentioning to me earlier, just kind of initially when the series was announced, you were super excited that oh, we were yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I'm I'm 35, so I was like the right age where I was watching like Buffy in middle school. Um, funny story with that, I never saw the movie, but I think they had a trailer for the movie on the VHS of like Dumb and Dumber. <laughs> nice. And and I had watched that so much as as a kid, so like I was aware of what Buffy was, and something clicked in my head when I saw this was coming out as a TV show. And, you know, you, when you're a kid, you're just, like, stupid. And you're just like, oh, I've heard of that thing. I should watch this show. Yeah. Yeah. That's how it works. I, yeah. I yeah. You know? So um, so I ended up, wa like, watching it from episode one. Mm -hmm. And, like, I, I was all in. Um, I, I got to college, and, like, Firefly was starting. And I, I yeah. saw Serenity with... Uh, friends in college and, and, and things like that. And, you know, like it was just, Joss was like the guy. He was like, he was the PG 13 Kevin Smith in a way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I actually, that's a good, and that's a good way of putting it. And he was known, you know, really smart dialogue, um, great characterization and cared about these sci-fi topics. That was, that was what we believed. Yeah, no, he was, he was the guy and he was, uh, he was considered revolutionary at the time as being this like big, like feminist and, mm -hmm. and uh, especially then with like uh, firefly, it was like, Oh, there's this, you, you know, like just diverse world and characters. And, um, you know, he was seen at the time as like being at like the forefront of all of this and, and being like, he's the guy that's fighting for, you know, women to be front and center in sci-fi and horror and things like that. Hi there. Um, question for Scarlett and Kobe. Um, working with Joss Whedon, who's obviously uh, renowned for the creating these strong female characters, uh, was that something that really came across during production of what is traditionally seen as a, quite a male-dominated genre? Uh, could you tell us a little about that, please? Um, well, uh, Joss was uh, very hands-on from the beginning in terms of creating the character, in terms of costuming, in terms of how long my bang was going to be, and um, and that continued um, on set. He was very hands-on with dialogue and, and always there for you. 
Um, I think he, Joss, when, I, when all of us had first met Joss, he, um, he, I mean, he met with each of us individually to kind of talk about what we wanted to see from our characters. And um, never, and, and we did talk about, um, you know, my character's plight and her, and her dark past and, you know, all of those things. And never did he say anything about my character's gender at all. And we never talked about it. And I think that exactly describes, or that's a perfect example of what, Joss, I think Joss is gen gender blind in some way. He, he, he wants his female characters to be, to be um, dynamic and um, competitive and, um, you know, assured and, and uh, confident. And, and, and it has nothing to do with um, anything but the fact that he just celebrates those kinds of strong female characters. I think he's, um, he's, he's just, uh, just, a, just a charming fellow that way. Like the Venn diagram had crossed over of somebody who really cares about geek culture, cares about the history, cares about the continuity, will respect it in a, in a strong way combined with uh, feminism and strong female characters and, and these areas. So you had it kind of all in one. I remember even people who would normally reject some of the feminism kind of topics were still appreciative of Joss Whedon, would still get really excited when he was going to do the Avengers. And it, because it was like, well, he brings a great product to the table. So that's what counts. And, and yeah. He, I think but all sides kind of were all behind him for a period. did have that, like, it, you know, and again, very similar to Kevin Smith, where, like, there was just mm -hmm. this, like, world renowned, like, everyone was just like, oh, yeah, no, we like him. Um, and and yeah. I think people also, you know, like, it's easy to forget that when they were talking about this, because this was right on the heels of Grant Morrison's new X-Men. Right. You know, so it's it's kind of hard to not talk about that a little bit when, when talking about this, but... Absolutely. It, it was a huge deal that they were getting. They were lining up this new writer um, and they were trying to keep it under wraps as long as possible that it was going to be Joss Whedon. And when that rumor was going around, it was huge. Yeah. This was a big news at the time. Yeah. This, this was like at the time you couldn't think of like a bigger get. Right. You know, who, who else would have been a bigger get? There really wasn't anyone. I remember because I was running a, a shop at this point, about ten years older than you, and I was um, I was very excited because for a couple of reasons. Um, first, the Grant Morrison run, and this is this also goes back to kind of that revisionist history. I think people today look back on that entire run as very successful, Morrison doing big things with the X Men. But what people forget a little bit is kind of midway through that run, after Frank quietly kind of moved off and wasn't on the book regularly, the sales had dipped and. Yeah. The response was pretty mixed. It was it was like the X Men's kind of weirdly out there. The other books were not doing terribly well. I think you had some other writers on there that were not particularly loved. And overall, like the the franchise had a big shot in the arm, but then it was starting to be in trouble. And so this Joss Whedon's going to come in. He's going to create the centerpiece. And I remember conversations going on of John Cassidy is not a big enough you know, powerful enough artist to line up with the Joss Whedon. Like people are questioning if Cassidy had the star power to, to hold his own with Whedon. And that was kind of the conversation that was going on before this book went out. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense. Uh, I mean, uh, I, I, I was a fan of, of John's. I mean, planetary is like just one of yeah, my favorite things, but, um, but yeah, he had never done like, th this had to have been his highest profile book he, he had done. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, uh, but it was seen as like, I remember conversations going on, even within Marvel is saying, you know, should we get a bigger profile artist? Is there, I mean, there, there were just a lot of serious conversations around this is going to be the biggest thing we do for a few years was this launch. Yeah. And it, it, it makes sense. I mean, yeah, I, I guess it makes sense. I'm just trying to think though, because at the same time, this is, there's a little bit of distance from, you know, Kevin Smith's Daredevil at this point, and I don't right. think that was the gigantic blockbuster that they had hoped it would be. It, it wasn't. Um, and But it, it was, uh, and, and it's funny kind of thinking about all this, and I was looking at some of the articles at the time, 
Um, none of this makes a whole lot of sense in hindsight. Like now from the benefit of looking at it from today backward, a lot of it seems crazy. But it was kind of, as you said, Joss Whedon was seen as the, you know, the, the king of the nerds, if, for lack of a better word. Yeah. Person, he was going to bring something super credibility to this title, um, the the MCU is starting to kind of kick up at this point, and it is it was it, it really was he was at the top of his game, and and I do think you know all things considered, uh, Cassidy's art was not the problem, at least not the quality of it <laughs> was not the problem when all was said and done. No, no, um, his his art wasn't, and, and we'll get into that because yeah. Cassidy has a lot of tropes. He just uses over and over again. Absolutely. Yeah. And, uh, to the point where like, it, you'll never look at the book again, uh, the same way after we sort of explain it, you'll, it'll be tainted for you forever. Yeah. Sorry about that. Yeah. yeah. We're, we're sorry, right. but, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, like it's, it's truly nuts. Like he was, it's crazy. They got Joss, um, Mm -hmm. it's, it's crazy uh he was able to do this it's crazy that I, I don't know how many people know this but joss wasn't the one who asked to bring colossus back it was marvel who asked joss to bring colossus back right that was editorially driven that it, they wanted that to happen yeah like because i think a lot of people you know i i had the assumption at the time that it was probably joss's idea because of course he's joss they let him do whatever he wants right and um, it seems like, oh, it must be him because he probably just wanted to write Kitty as Buffy. And like, if you're mm -hmm. going to do that, you might as well bring Colossus back. But that's not how it happened, which, which is interesting. Yeah, no. And there were some rewrites, as I recall, up almost to the last minute and, and some art that was changed. I mean, it is tough because they did the the I don't want to say bait and switch, but they produced some fake covers and some fake art that was going to show Jean Grey coming back to life in the fourth issue. Um, that was intentional. They knew they were bringing Colossus at that point, and they were trying to kind of fake out the readers and kind of play with internet spoilers and other things. And they're proud of themselves for having done that. Uh, but it is it, it, there was a lot that was decided kind of in the last minute with the series. And if you do read it all in one go, it actually becomes a little bit more clear because they do they make an effort to introduce some characters and some things that seem to take a left turn seemingly out of nowhere. Yeah, and uh, also w what's interesting is this team. Uh, they really pushed outside of Astonishing because you got around towards the end of this, I think, or right after it ended, you had uh, Phoenix, End Song, and War Song. Right. Where they did bring Jean Grey back. Uh, it was Greg Pak wrote that. Right. And um, and yeah, it was this team from Astonishing. It's like vaguely in continuity. I think it technically takes place like towards the end in Astonishing. Like, but um, But yeah, they bring the Phoenix Force back. They bring Jean back. Everyone kind of forgot that happened, and then when X Men Red came out, like a uh, couple of years ago or so, mm -hmm. everyone was like, "This is the first time Jean Grey's been back from the dead in like over a decade, or, or over in like um, <laughs> since since she died in in New X Men." And it was like, actually, she came back really quickly. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and I we just act like that. They, they totally glossed over that for sure. Um, yeah. And it, 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 there were some other, this is right about the time uh, House of M is coming out toward the end of this. Yeah. And that was the team that was used there as well. And didn't, didn't this get too, like Astonishing X-Men was supposed to wrap before the big reveals in, in House of M. And I think this ended up shipping after. Yeah, it did. So the timing gets weird because in House of M, you have a scene with Kitty kind of reuniting with Professor X, which came a couple months after uh, the, the kind of the showdown midway through the series. Yeah. And so of course, then the house of M events fall out completely after that, where the mutants are depowered, but you don't, you, that doesn't, that isn't really touched on, uh, or I, I shouldn't say isn't really, it isn't touched on in this yeah. comic. So the timeline does not work if you put it up against other things. Yeah. And, uh, and a lot of that is just because of the massive delays. I think what, after issue 12, it started shipping every other month. Yeah, and, and and even less frequently than that, it it seemed yeah. like, um, and I've never been able to get a straight answer why they did it this way. But you had, you had the the twelve issues, and then you had a, a pause, and then you had, you know, twelve more issues, and then you had these giant size X Men bookends at the end, which 
was unclear why they did it that way. Is it just that they wanted to not go to 26 and they went like, there was some confusion in the shipping schedule as well. And I know at least some of that has to do with uh, Cassidy and kind of some delays on his end too. Yeah. I mean, uh, Cassidy was notoriously late. Um, there, there are stories about how uh, Marvel would send couriers to Cassidy's place to pick up pages so they could physically scan them and, and get the ball rolling as he kept, drawing because that's how, how late he was going yeah i, I it it uh it, it was it was a hard book to schedule and 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 definitely that that had an impact and you see the quality of work actually from issue one you get to some of the giant size at the end and you see a lot of reuse of, of backgrounds and, and things get things do degrade uh, significantly through this this event oh yeah I, I mean you will also see like throughout the whole thing there there are um you know, uh, this is the part where you're never going to look at this book the same. <laughs> but um, I would say, and I think I'm being generous here, nearly half, probably about 40% of the entire run are wide stacked panels that are mostly just uh, one or so people like standing around having a facial expression. Yeah. And often the same facial expression. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like they'll they'll re they'll you will see like people standing in like a kitchen or something, for example, mm -hmm. and they're moving around a little bit, but like the background is stagnant, so it's clearly like okay, we're just going to copy and paste the background, yeah, you know, for these three panels, and then I'm going to kind of redraw one of these figures a couple of times, and these two characters are just going to be staring at this person so we're just going to copy and paste them too like there, there's a lot of that there is I, I mean i think toward the end um when they're on the space station and other things uh we we get to two kind of very commonly used elements we get a uh kind of these space sequences where there's a ton of copy and paste like you see these same things repeated a, a lot within the same panel and then others where you know, conveniently, the character's just in this place with no walls or no coloring or anything. And it's just yeah. like this, like, yeah, you just have this smooth silver bullet of metal. It's like, <laughs> that's handy, you know? <laughs> yeah, it, it is. But, um, it, you know, so a, a lot of credit to Laura Martin, who's the uh, colorist yeah. on, on this uh, series, because she does a lot of heavy lifting in, yeah. in this book. Oh, um, absolutely. Ab absolutely. She does. Yeah. <laughs> So this, this, this book, this title itself, well, I, I guess we should talk a little bit more. So this thing comes out, of course, Joss Whedon will go on to do the Avengers and start to become the MCUs. It ha has a weird run there where we get the Avengers, which is seen as a triumph moment for him. And then Avengers two, which is seen as a, a confusing misfire <laughs> in many ways. And yes, the that broke him. Uh, overall, Avengers Age of Ultron is harder to make than anything I have ever made or perhaps everything put together. Um, this is the hardest job I've ever had. Um, and then he moves over to Justice League and becomes a pariah somewhere during this whole... And, and But weirdly, simultaneously from both groups at once. So you had, you had a group that loved him for, for being cool with nerd culture and, and continuity in comics and the group that loved him for strong feminist takes on characters. And almost simultaneously, both groups collapsed. So there have also even been claims that Whedon's receiving death threats from feminists, but there's no actual evidence of this. I did not find any, hey, Joss Whedon, we're feminists and we're going to kill you tweets. And I was, I was really looking. So let's read some of the tweets that we did see. At Pat Oswalt says, yep, there is a Tea Party equivalent of progressivism, liberalism, and they just chased Joss Whedon off Twitter. Good job, guys. Ugh. Uh, so again, we don't know if that's what happened. That's sort of a theory that people have right now. We know Joss Whedon was getting a lot of criticism from feminists on Twitter. We don't know that that's what drove him off of Twitter. A Ashley Escada says, maybe if Twitter starts losing people like Joss Whedon, we can finally get some decent harassment tools on this platform. That's definitely been a thing people have been calling out for a long time. They need to sort of better police Twitter when people are getting harassed like maybe Joss was allegedly. Yeah. Um... Part of that was, uh, even though Avengers, the, the first one, went over really well, everyone like, generally loved it, or at least were like, that's the best you're going to do with the kind of movie this is. Um, the, the, you had that. Then you had, I think, Man of Steel came out in between, because I think that was 2013. 
So it came out before uh, Age of Ultron. So you already kind of had this, like, you know, Joss Whedon's the guy carrying the MCU, and then you have Zack Snyder trying to build this, like, DCU at the same time. Mm -hmm. And so that's going on, or the DCEU, whatever they call it. (laughs) And then... uh, then you have Joss do Age of Ultron. And Age of Ultron was a misfire for multiple reasons. Yeah. Uh, you had the rushing of Ultron, where everything kind of felt organic. We already knew who Loki was, and he's the villain in you know, Avengers. And uh, you know, for Age of Ultron, it, it just felt rushed. There, it felt like there was more studio interference. There was that weird Thor scene where... You know, they they had him, like, look into a pool or whatever and be like, I see visions of the next movie I'm in. <laughs> yeah, very handy. He's he yeah. a trailer, yeah. Yeah, you had weird stuff like that. Everyone wants to know, are you still going to maybe be involved with Marvel, maybe give notes on a script, or is it sort of like, I need a real break for a while? Well, I'm definitely going to take a real break for a couple of months because my brain is no longer. But... Um, uh, you know, I've looked at both options. I love these guys. I love these movies. They're exciting. But part of me does think, you know what? You know, I got to find out what's next. Then you had a couple of scenes that people really uh, clung on to. Uh, there was the the scene of uh, trying to pick up the hammer, and I forget the exact line, but Tony mentioned something, and like it, it's a reference to how like if the king were to ask you to sleep with him it it's automatically consensual right like i forget the exact term that that was used i haven't watched the movie in a long time but um i I remember people were upset about that and then people were also upset about the exchange with hulk and black widow and the whole thing that it It was summed up basically as Black Widow that she's barren is like a monster and can somehow relate to the Hulk because not being able to have kids makes her a monster. Something like that. So again, it's been a long time. I'm not I'm not trying to diminish it because I don't care. I'm diminishing it in the sense that I'm like, I don't remember exactly. It's been a long time since I watched it. Well, and there was a lot. There, there was a lot that kind of hit all at once. We, we, and and this is all relevant to this comic that we're we're talking about. But it, 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 there was this leak that in Firefly, if that series would be that had continued, there would have been a relationship kind of built on a, a gang rape or something that that then led to these characters seeing each other for the first. I mean, it just there's just some very weird things came out of all of his different projects, and like a bunch of it all just kind of collapsed all at once. Yeah, you'd have that. You'd have people revisiting some of the uh, darker elements from season six of Buffy that didn't age well. Right. Um, you, you know, the uh, Spike Buffy encounter. Um, mm-hmm. You had um, around then, before Justice League, I think you started to hear uh, more r- rumors and whispers of, of uh, his infidelities. Mm-hmm. Um, which I, I think really started coming out more maybe around Justice League, but, um, you know, all that was starting. So Kai Cole wrote this piece um, in The Wrap, uh, an op-ed about her experience, and I want to give you a little portion of it just so you kind of get where she's coming from and then we can have a discussion. Uh, she writes that 15 years later, 15 years after they were married, uh, when he was done with our marriage and finally ready to tell the truth, he wrote me, when I was running Buffy, I was surrounded by beautiful, needy, aggressive young women. It felt like I had a disease, like something from a Greek myth. Suddenly, I'm a powerful producer, and the world is laid out at my feet, and I can't touch it. But he did touch it. So let me give you a little bit more. Um, She writes, when he walked out of our marriage and was trying to make things seem less bewildering to me to help me understand how he could have lied to me for so long, he said, in many ways, I was the height of normal in this culture. We're taught to be providers and companions at the same time to conquer and acquire, specifically sexually, and I was pulling off both. And then obviously, I mean, he went from doing one of the higher grossing superhero movies to uh, one of the biggest bombs in the history of cinema. That landed on his shoulders too. Uh, And it, it, 
it, but it's funny to watch because it's, it's, I'm fascinated by the idea of perceptions. Cause so you have these comics, it's made, it's done. And like we talked about, there's so much excitement. The, the issue sold really, really well. I mean, my perspective as a fan was this, this will be exciting. I remember being excited about it as a store owner. I was super excited about it. Cause this was going to sell. And that was good news. Yeah. And, and so a lot of happiness, but today, if you refer to this astonishing X-Men run by Whedon, there's almost a guaranteed negative response. If you roll this out on social media or you talk about this issue, nine times out of 10, people are going to have a, a negative response. And I think a lot of it has to do with his roller coaster that, that was Joss Whedon. Yeah. And um, also put this in perspective for people. Issue one of Astonishing X-Men sold more than issue one of uh, House of X. Oh, yeah. Yeah. By a lot. Yeah. Like that, that, that was, uh, and, and, you know, that, and that's not even including like the reprints and all that, that they'd go on to do. And, you know, obviously the amount of reprints, uh, you know, uh, doing the oversized hardcovers, the trades, the omnibuses, like this is, there is almost no way for House of X Powers of 10 to ever come close to the sales that Astonishing did for Marvel. No, it, it absolutely right. I'll, I'll pull for the, but it, it, it was, it was a huge, um, it, it did a huge amount of sales and you, the trades did really well and continue to do largely pretty well. But this series, it almost, the Grant Morrison run of New X-Men has overtaken it again as being more true to the X-Men universe or whatever you happen to be. And for a lot of collectors, creators, they'll refer to that Grant Morrison run as being the good one again. Whereas yeah. when this started, it was on the outs. It's, just, it's fascinating how these things flip around. Yeah, I, I remember those conversations. And I remember in like the mid to late 2000s, Astonishing X-Men was hands down the better one. Right. Yeah. In, you know, in these conversations. And then by the time you got to like the, you know, 2012, 2013, like as time kept going, I started noticing more and more people coming out with the, well, actually, Grant Morrison did the better run. Like you'd start getting that. Um, one thing I do appreciate from Grant's run, which, which again, that's something like we could probably end up doing a video on if we wanted, but yeah. Um, one thing that I think gets overlooked a bit is, um, he did go back to, uh, some more of the roots from, you know, Stanley and Jack Kirby of, you don't necessarily want to be these people. He was, he introduced, uh, some more like ugly, disgusting mutants. Right. And I think uh, one of the one of the things that Claremont did that uh, diverted from that or diverged from that uh, original vision was he was creating more characters that had like sex appeal as, as it was becoming more of this like soap opera kind of book, right? And um, and Grant kind of took it back to those like Stanley Jack Kirby roots of like, no, a lot of these X-Men don't really, these mutants don't want to be mutants. They're called mutants for a reason and they're ugly, disgusting things. Yeah. Y you know, so, so I do appreciate that. And uh, that largely falls to the wayside with a few exceptions in Joss's run. It is. So I, I pulled the, just because I was curious, the, the first issue of this uh, sold for its first printing, let alone all the rest, uh, sold 209,000 units. And the trade paperback is still considered one of the strongest selling of the last 20 years that came out. And the title held its numbers much better. It didn't, it didn't drop as month to month went on um, nearly like any of its peers. So it, it really was, I mean, if you think about Today, that would be a crazy success. House of X Powers of 10 did not reach those numbers. It, 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 is, it was a strong book. Yeah, I, I mean, it also goes to show you the power of keeping a consistent art team. Right. Oh, I don't know. agree. Yeah. Yeah, that's, it's so important. If you want to keep people engaged in a story, if you're, if you're keeping that art team consistent, uh, people, I think, would rather... An issue that's like maybe it's not the artist at the top of their game. They'd rather that than a revolving door of three like artists that keep coming in and out of a book. Oh, ab absolutely. I mean, if you think about it, um, despite all the delays and everything else, this was twenty six issues. John Cassidy uninterrupted, and it it it. There's a lot of strength to that. I I mean, we we you just do not see that anywhere today from the big two anyway. 
yeah, no, you, you, you never see that. But, um, but yeah, and uh, the first issue uh, of this book is very much a departure from what Grant was doing and, and what a lot of people were doing with uh, the X-Men. So getting into that, so the, the series in general has, I think it can be broken into kind of four sections, conveniently, uh, in, <laughs> in like a very convenient in series of six. Yeah. Uh, but it, it, you're absolutely right. So in the first issue, not only does it set up kind of some new things, new status quo brings Kitty back, which I, I think at the time people saw as a, an analogy for Buffy. Yeah. At least, uh, and, and was written that way in a lot of cases. Uh, but they went out of their way to make a bunch of statements divorcing themselves from the Grant Morrison run. We got, you know, Cyclops talking about we need to be heroes and we're going to be looked at as heroes, you know, no more leather and jeans kind of thing. And it, it, it really, it, it felt like they were really trying to put a point on it that this was going to be a different book. Yeah, they, they made that point very clear in the beginning. Um, they go... <sighs> what was it like um it's all through like kitty's pov in the beginning right they're walking into the school basically she walks in on a speech like it it was a clever way to do the um exposition dump of like oh i'm I'm walking in on this speech you're addressing the class aka the audience on Mm -hmm. what the status quo of the school is gonna be and it's interesting because this first issue has I would say some action, but generally limited action. Yeah. Um, and But there's not a lot of, I, I mean, the, the talking is, you know, plenty of word bubbles, but it's it's relatively sparing. I mean, it, it compared to a lot of comics today where they want to do an expedition exposition issue, uh, there's a lot of talk through with expressions and with moments. Um, I, they do a pretty solid job, I think, in this first issue, setting up what the story and the, the MO is supposed to be. Yeah, they they do one one of the glaring confusing things in, in this first issue is um people who are reading X-Men around this time um what was it? it there was a falling out that Beast and Cyclops had over how Cyclops was handling Jean's death. Right. Um uh, that I think that was going on in um New X-Men, I think the issues that like Chuck Austin took over after uh, Grant left. Yep. So, so that's happening. And then in this issue, Beast is like, eh, fine. We never had a falling out. We're cool. <laughs> yeah, they they definitely shuffled around. It it didn't line up with what other X writers were doing um, at all. Uh, yeah. it, from Wolverine's personality to kind of how everybody was handling things to kind of the dynamic that they were establishing with Kitty really wasn't being picked up anywhere else. Uh, it, but it, it, it was, at least it was consistent, you know, having read through all the issues, they do keep the, the characters relatively, uh, they, they don't change them through the course of this, this series, at least. Yeah. Like it's all consistent within itself. <laughs> yeah. But, but what was it? Yeah. It's all, all it's all consistent that way. How, however, yeah, like it, it, it it's a little frustrating if you were reading the other X titles and hoping that there, there would be characters consistent. Yeah. With it. And, and for that matter, it, it, I know there was some frustration with other people in the X office that Whedon was basically being allowed to kind of write things however he wants. And no few editors weren't stepping in and, and saying that you have to change it or coordinate. I mean, it was his show. Yeah. Like it, it, it was his show and, and you can tell because of the sense of humor. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> like um, and uh, you know, like I'm I'm flipping through it again right now, and it's very like, it's it's new reader friendly in a way that I don't think a lot of like other Marvel books have quite figured out. I agree. So it, you can. I've heard this from a lot of other people as well, and, and even when we were selling this, it was this was a title you could recommend to somebody new. And it didn't really matter. I mean, it helped because, and it was it was strange because Joss was coming in with this perception of being strong continuity, would be respectful of the source material, and yet you could come into this thing and not really know any of the characters and pick it up and read it and figure out what's going on. Yeah, it's uh, it, it it was easy to to sort of place everything, figure out the characters, the the characterization of everyone's really strong. Yeah. 
in a way that, uh, again, like I think weaker writers that tackle the X-Men in, in, instead of doing strong characterizations, they just decide there are characters that aren't worth it and just have them like fade into the background. And you don't have this here. That's in part because it's a really tight grouping. Right. You know, and it's easy to sort of, you know, create, create foils to each other and, and to hone in on the characteristics that make these characters different. And mm -hmm. yeah, like that, it was all very smart in how they did it. it. It was. I mean, we don't see, you You see the core group here. You see uh, this, this is Cyclops, it's Beast, it's Emma, it's Wolverine, um, and it's Kitty, and ultimately uh, Colossus. And then they kind of bring armor into the picture at some point. Uh, but it's, it is a small group. N none of the other X-Men make an appearance. I think it, at any point and maybe in giant size, we get somebody in the background, but yeah, in giant size, I know we see storm, but, um, but for the most part, yeah, there, there's, it doesn't interact with the other X books. Yeah. And in that way, it feels like its own thing. And, and in many cases, I know that there's been at least some speculation or some feeling like this was almost a, an Elseworlds-like title, although clearly it's not because it brings things into continuity. And a lot of the characters and things that were introduced to this, Karen Gillian and others would would really take and run with years later. But it, it really does have a book set apart feel to it. Yeah, no, absolutely. And that's, I think, part of what helped it be such a strong uh, trade seller in the aftermarket. You know, you really, you do not need to read, like, if you read Grant's run, it would help because Joss clearly read Grant's run and remembered stuff from, like, Dark Phoenix Saga, and that's so much of this book. <laughs> but, yeah. it, it, you know, uh, it's very clear that, that Joss was vaguely a fan of X-Men and probably enjoyed it more, um... Uh, as like someone who briefly read it years ago, then someone who was like really an immersed fan of, of the franchise. Yeah, I, I, it, it, it really, it really is. And I think, I, I don't know, you, you just reading through it again, it is, you do, you, you are struck by, you mentioned it before. I mean, Emma has a, has a very consistent, very defined personality. Control of your powers. The safety of those around you is of paramount importance. Violence of any kind will never be tolerated. Uh, Cyclops, it does to some extent. His personality tends to wander toward the uh, the end of it. He becomes more of kind of a generic uh, Joss Whedon, you know, male lead character. Uh, yeah. But you do get some you get some interesting moments in here. So, what did you think? So, this first arc, this first act, it it really is intended to set up this cure for mutants, bring back Colossus, kind of unify the team. Now, those seem to be the, the kind of the three goals that they were after. Yeah, the the goals uh, were, were very much it was, it was that, and it was. Uh, I'm trying to think. It, one of the things that Joss made a point of, like, because uh, in the omnibus edition, they they have like email exchanges he had with like Mike Martz and, and people like that, and, and Joss makes it very clear the goal of this book and, and we touched on this a little earlier but his goal was they're going to be heroes again they're going to be a superhero team and in that regard uh, Joss fails so thoroughly and miserably oh absolutely uh, I absolutely and that what you you know you read it stated actually on the page in the first issue that this is about having costumes this is about being heroes again, and we get a couple moments of the X Men trying to do this, and they they have mixed success. But by and large, it's a very insular tale. The majority of the action happens at the mansion or somewhere off in space, and it really is a very small scale story. Where, and by that I mean just like the the audience is just themselves. It's very inward looking for the X Men. Yeah, um, you know, like. Uh there's that, and then you have the whole Ord thing, and Ord and the aliens from Breakworld. Yeah. That's, to me, one of the sore points of this whole run. I is, agree. Um, Ord, Ord is a, has a horrible design. Yeah. Um, even at the time, when I was excited about this book, I was just like, ah, why? <laughs> like, 
I, it, I don't know what it is about the writers come into a series and they like right out the gate. They want to introduce us to some huge threat, random alien creature. We saw Bendis do it with Superman. It just, it keeps this, this continues in comics and it's, it is, it was a weird design. You, the motives were either stupid or unclear. Um, <laughs> I mean, they became clear, but they 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 stayed stupid throughout this whole thing. Yeah, it is. Uh, God, I mean, that that's stupid. And then um, we also get uh, Doctor uh, Rao, right? Doctor Rao, Doctor Rao. If I forget how you say, it. Let's but, say uh, Dr. Rao, yeah, yeah, Doctor Rao, because the, the, this is where, like, it's in hindsight, it's like, how is this? new reader friendly like in in terms of this first arc is so needlessly convoluted because it's like there's an alien that wants to get mutants cured and there's a mutant cure from dr rao and like it's like what this is how you're launching this book <laughs> I worked for decades to reach my place. Nothing could stop me. It, it was, yeah. I mean, and it is that dynamic of they, they have several pages setting up what is a very clear, simple MO. We're going to be heroes. We're going to go out there. We're going to be a team again. We get some personalization. But then the backdrop plot that they're going to go up against is this very strange Dr. Rao and is she a hero or a villain? I mean, she's doing things for the wrong things for the right reasons or I, who knows? And then we're resurrecting Colossus in that and there's an alien and he's trying to save his planet by curing the mutants. And it's like, and they invest a lot of time in Dr. Rao who goes nowhere. Yeah. Um, the, what ends up happening is she's really a villain because she's what inspires the main plot thread of, uh, X three last stand. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 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 that's great. Yeah, yeah. So uh, that—that's what we got out of this run, folks. One of the single worst X Men movies. <laughs> and it's—it's it's also, I mean, it's—it's it's also uh, an indication of timing or maybe a lack of coordination in the X office because you're setting up this threat where, and we see it in the comic with this uh, student wing uh, that it, they can take away mutant powers quickly through this "quote unquote" cure. We get an interesting dilemma of Beast trying to figure out if he should take it or not since he's devolving. And, and what it means to be a mutant and all the rest. And then midway through this series, as Joss Whedon continues, we kind of drop that as a threat because we're doing House of M where a bunch of the mutants are just eliminated through Scarlet Witch magic. Like it, it, it's, it, it's two simultaneous competing ideas where Joss has to kind of drop his, I think. Or I, I don't know, that just, it makes a brief appearance and then just kind of vanishes. Yeah, they, they never go back to it, and they just lean more into the, the whole Breakworld thing and um, how Breakworld is... Th this is where the whole, like, none of the book makes sense from, like, right out the gate. But you don't realize that till you get to the end, that this book is so fucking stupid. Well, I mean, yeah, and, and, and they go to pains in this book of talking, Dr. Rao is saying, you know, even if you destroy this lab, we've got these vials of treatment all around the world. And you know, there, this will happen and we are going to end the mutant threat and all the rest. And you get kind of the standoff with shield. And then this, this new, we'll get to that in a second, this new secret agency that's been developed. And then they, they just, they, they never go back to it. Where are the, where are the other cures? Are, are they really, was it a bluff? Are they not around? Did everything just get shut down? Did Nick Fury stop it? Did the, did the villains get a hold of this mutant? serum or what what happened yeah um we never go back to if mutants got to get the cure or not <laughs> it's never talked about after like this right it, it's it's very weird how they handle it um the x-men all come off very selfish and unheroic yeah because their only motivation is basically to preserve themselves, and they almost have a discussion about it, but they leave the discussion at the point where it's like, no, you all sound like you don't care that there are people who would benefit from this cure. You don't want it no matter what. 
Yeah, it, it is strange because as soon as they get to the sticky part, then like a ship launches into space and they have to carry people away or, 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 and, and then when we finally kind of get back to the topic, it doesn't ring true. You know, the, the beast is asked kind of at the end of the first arc, are you going to take this cure or not? Because he has some real concerns that he's devolving into just kind of an animal. And, uh, he's like, well, I'm going to continue to think about it and I'll let you know before I do it. I owe you that much. And, and then we're done. I, you know, yeah. and then, um, we have the stupid applause bit where like, uh, Lockheed shows up to breathe fire on a word. Mm-hmm. And then everyone at home is like, yay, that's Lockheed. I, I remember Lockheed. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like it's, and the whole Colossus thing, Colossus coming back issue four, which is right. very Whedon-esque. It's done in a really like, Kitty's the one that finds him. What does that mean? Is this fate? Like, yeah, k- k- kind of stuff. And it's kind of like, and the answer to that is, I don't know, maybe. <laughs> it, it was a it, yeah, I love the the explanation here and it, it you know I think at the time I remember this came out a lot of people again were happy that this was a, a big moment because it it hadn't been reused we hadn't seen the overexposure of some of Whedon's tropes we hadn't seen the same kind of thing we hadn't seen the invasion of quips uh in fact every Marvel book during uh, Bendis's run on Avengers like a lot of this stuff was new uh, reading back on it now I like you, you roll your eyes every other panel sometimes with kind of this quippy type dialogue and this, this return of Colossus. I, I get there's good parts and bad parts. There's part where Cassidy is showing kind of the exhaustion through a panel, of like the head going down and then coming back up and you get some good, you get some good panel work without words, but you also get this. Are we, are we back in the romance or not? Or it's complicated. It's uh, love angst. It is, it is very Whedon esque. It's very Whedon-esque, and then um, he kind of restrains himself being quippy with a character like Colossus, but he still manages to not write Colossus right. Right. (laughs) He, like, Colossus just randomly is filled with hateful rage and borderline murders people. Yeah, it, 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 the, the Colossus return, they skate over some of the bits. Like, he died pretty definitively. And it's like, well, but then they swapped the body and then brought me back to life. So this happened some time ago. And then you kept me in a weird underground prison and you tortured me, experimented on me, I, I guess. He's been hanging out down there. It, it's kind of weird that this was a secret. But... It is, it, it, but then, but then the the rest of the series it has these moments where he's just filled with anger and rage and wants to destroy things, or hook up with Kitty. That's pretty much what Colossus becomes. Yeah, and like Colossus's whole character is he's not a hateful person. Like, um, <clears throat> I think what was it? And like back in like Mutant Massacre, I think they made a whole big deal about how like, oh my God, Colossus had to like kill someone, and that was like an earth shattering experience for him. Yeah. It crushed him. And, and, and what's odd is as Colossus is saying things like I am filled with rage now and other things, Wolverine and others will say, ah, we, that's our PD. We got our PD back. And it's like, no, this is a completely different personality than the guy you knew. (laughs) Yeah. And then, um, that's if Wolverine isn't just saying, I like beer. Ha ha ha. Yeah. Which he does way too much in this. Then I got just two words for you, bub. The doctor tells you there would be no one nightmares. Did you always know she was lying? We all walk away from this like nothing happened. Yeah, beer becomes uh, pretty much his core personality in this thing. Um, but it, it is odd. But we also, before the end of this first arc, we get the introduction of Abigail Brand, who uh, is going to continue to be a pretty major part in the Marvel Universe, the announcement of Al Ewing's sword. But he, she is this new character, a, a new a a, uh, a new Nick Fury, a Nick Fury for space. And she's tough. 
Yeah, she's uh, just Nick Fury, really. It's <laughs> it's not really. I, I don't. It's like why, like you're knowingly creating this like redundant character. And and that's I remember when this issue came out and people were talking about kind of a a new powerful female character, and it's like, but she's a she's just a clone of Nick Fury. Like there's other better character work going on in other parts of the book. Uh, for all the the rest of it, what they were doing with Emma was pretty complex in some ways, but Brand is pretty one dimensional throughout this whole thing. Yeah, um, she's bossy and vaguely horny for beast until she's openly horny for beast yeah <laughs> that's right that's that's all we get with her and then she's a mutant apparently or has some kind of powers or she's like half alien like it's it's stupid but um she's got it, glowy hands yes it's, and, it's almost as stupid as the start of the next arc as almost <laughs> she does deliver us some lines i guess we'll, we'll get to them later but she does deliver the kind of the memorable uh line that i was gonna say doesn't age well but it, it, it never aged well it was the I, I never get gang raped on my first date yeah that's just uh how about you just never say that <laughs> <I don't- laughs> like, there, yeah. Um, what a strange comment. Um, there, there are some moments as they're they're pulling out the different quips uh, throughout this whole thing where it's like, uh, <laughs> why, <laughs> why are you saying this? There's just some weird dialogue in this thing. Yeah, uh, there, there's weird dialogue. There's weird. Um, as you're reading it, you're just like, it feels like Whedon was obsessed with being like the first guy to very very clearly make it that Colossus and Kitty are banging. Yeah. Like he, he seems to take a, a weird pride in that. Yeah. Where yeah, that's a very big moment. Um, f- for strange reasons. Yeah. And, uh, uh, more strange stuff. That's just, again, stupid. Um, the X-Men start the next arc by fighting yeah. a, big fantastic four style monster and this is supposed to be the callback to we're heroes now and and it's it's strange because well well real quick before i get to that so right the first arc ends with there's some shenanigans going on with emma she's talking to somebody and then she's not on the level with who she is we, we referenced this early conversation we had with kitty pry where she's like you're going to be my fail safe in case everything goes bad i can trust you and so we're, we're as we enter into our new arc Emma, something's going on with Emma, and that's going to be a big thread we've got to deal with. Yeah, something really stupid. Yeah. Um, it's ve- it ages so, like, it's just like, oh, I wonder if it's the only thing it could possibly be. Exactly. Um, <laughs> it, so our second arc opens, one of the students' wing has been cured by this cure that we've forgotten about, kind of by this point almost. Um it's bad things look like they're going for him, but we, we then flash to the X-Men wanting to fight a monster to be heroes, but maybe more importantly for good PR. Yeah. And this is the only time they do that. This whole series, right. the only time we see them fight something for good PR and to be heroes. And it's stepping on the toes of the fantastic four in a way that any casual reader would have been like, this is a fantastic four thing. Yeah, I I always felt like Joss Whedon was kind of setting this up as an idea and maybe editorial or Whedon or somebody figured that some of the other X books would pick up the slack on this and show them doing non-traditional missions to be heroic. But it doesn't help when your goal to be heroic uh, is interspersed with you talking about being in front of the cameras and getting some good PR and then watching TV later and complaining you didn't get good PR like that. it, It. it is not the, uh, it doesn't really underscore the heroic part. No, it, it, it really shows that they're not heroic at any point in this entire thing, which is the whole point of this book was to make them heroic. And he fails every step of the way consistently. Yeah, it, it is. It is like the, it's the Lucy pulling the football. Like he sets things up, but then before it even plays out, he undermines his own point of what he's trying to do. 
Yeah, which it's it's mind boggling. You would think any idiot reading this or any of these scripts would have been like, hey, Joss, I know you said like the one thing you wanted to do was have them heroic. And, uh, you know, we're like seven issues in and they haven't been heroic yet. What's what's the deal? <laughs> well, and, and just like get rid of this page where they're debating kind of fake news and like like and this is the part that is aged worse where cyclops is like you're missing the point the news isn't there to tell you what happened it's there to tell you what you want to hear or what it thinks you want to hear it's like and he goes into this the, the news just wants to do the mutant menace story and and everything i mean it's just this this page is a bad page for what the book's trying to do yeah, and also, like, this kind of commentary, like, Ecstatics, like, just did this and did it better. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You it, know? It's odd. I, I So, uh, as they're debating kind of their, their uh, you know, QR rating, we get, us, we get the, the, the boy has, uh, Wing has killed himself in the danger room. And yeah. And this is bad. Is this the introduction of Blindfold? Was she a Whedon creation? I think, I don't think so. I do think Blindfold, in fact, I'm, I'm 99% positive Blindfold did show up in the Morrison run, but not, but just as, as kind of a bit character. And several yeah. of these characters just showed up as kind of bit characters there, and then Whedon did flesh them out more. But we do get Blindfold, so that's good. Yeah, and then we get uh, one of our only appearances of the Cuckoos. <laughs> right. Yeah, they briefly make an appearance, which you think would be pretty significant for what the third act of this book, but anyway, <laughs> um, so there's some kind of big psychic attack. And meanwhile, we get some hillbillies who for some reason have found a sentinel, um, and drug it to their barn. And of course the sentinel proceeds to escape and then go amok, run amok. And, and so the, they, we've got multiple battles. So we got a dead kid in the danger room. We got a psychic attack in the in the X Mansion. We've got a Sentinel coming onto the grounds that wants revenge against their oppressors, and all these plates are now spinning. Yeah, this this is where uh, you know it starts falling apart even more because yeah. we're starting to move more and more away from any grounded logic. Because why the hell would there just be Sentinels that were taken care of by? the companies that make sentinels or the government or the x-men yeah why, why would this like why would this sentinel be around that is functional that, sure. uh, why how is the sentinel able to sneak up on them in the yard like they, there's this shot where they're in the the front yard of the mansion and like i, I wonder if some stuff's going on out here we better look around and the lights go off and then suddenly you get a sentinel jump scare from the gate, but I mean, I, I don't know. I, this is a dumb thing to pick at, but you would hear this thing coming. It's huge. Yeah, you'd hear it coming, and also there's a lot of like pretentious student writer bullshit where yeah. uh, the Sentinel is just talking biblically. Yeah, <laughs> for no reason. Never, never brought up. No, it's 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 strange why the, I mean why the Sentinels behaving this way. We get a couple of the you know the X Men get to show off their power sets and everything else. Kitty goes and and the the best possible way to defend the the other students is to take them into the room with the kid who killed himself. And so they're in there with this, and I guess they didn't know at the time when they herded all the students into the room where the Wing was lying bloody on the floor. But this was a clever trap. Yeah, it's uh, that it doesn't make any sense. Why? Why would the X Mansion not have like a fallout shelter and just have a danger room to hide in? That doesn't make any sense. No, uh, it, it it doesn't. And and this this sequence is very kind of set up. But we we get the big reveal that it's the danger room that's angry, and Kitty has led the students into a trap. And then we're we're almost getting a horror comic now. Yeah, yeah, this is, um, you know, we get some interesting visuals here, but but again, it's very, like, why, why is this happening <laughs> like this? Like, it's... It, it's a weird plan. I mean, it's it's a very strange, convoluted plan. I mean, the, the danger room is playing everyone and continues to play everyone. Like, the goal was not just to get the students in there. The goal was to get Colossus to rage out and just, like, destroy the wiring. To the danger room 
through the attic I, I, or whatever he's doing there. This is another sequence, by the way, where Colossus is just kind of screaming in rage and destroying stuff. And Wolverine's like, Peter's really back. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Peter's really back. I love beer. That's yeah. all it says. It, it, is, it is odd. So they go in there, but this is all a big plan to get the X-Men to inadvertently destroy the kind of master control ball <laughs> that will free danger. Yeah. And, uh, God, danger is such a, uh, da- danger is another one of those weird characters where it's like, why did danger stick around after all of this? It is weird. I like, cause this became a major part of, I don't think Matt fraction did too much with her, but maybe I'm mistaken there. I know that, uh, Kieran Gillian did a lot with her yeah. and we just saw a lot of danger like people were enamored by this character but this character is is terrible <laughs> <laughs> i don't know maybe or, or i'll put another one it wasn't for me uh, yeah it, it's it's a, a very stupid character we just get this whole issue of uh it's just very like it's excuses to have visually interesting things without actually moving the plot forward yeah exactly and 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 so you, you get a big fight and you get danger becomes a, a, a thing, a, an actual human form. And, but it's still all a clever shenanigans plot to find professor X, to find Charles Xavier and enact revenge. Yeah. <laughs> but, but it's, it's, it, it <laughs> At this point, it it should be worth noting that this was where Professor X was taking a hiatus from the X-Men. Um, he had thought dead from uh, wherever he, he was. He, he was thought to be dead, and but he was actually off on Genosha with Magneto kind of cleaning stuff up was was what they had him doing at the time. For some yeah, it, it was. Yeah, he like um, he stayed there. After like uh, what was it? He got dropped off by Nick Fury, and then Nick Fury had that whole thing where he's just like, "Oh, I'm gonna like uh, I just agreed to give you a ride here, and my revenge on you is not taking you home." Right. <laughs> it was that whole bit, and uh, he just stays in Genosha, and and tries to just kind of. I, it was unclear what he was doing there exactly. Uh, yes, but we get. Lots of shots of Abigail Brand and this sword group that is comprised of, of aliens and humans and random people taking track of space things. Uh, however, they seem primarily focused on the Earth and what's going on at the X-Mansion. And they, they're watching all this crap go down. And, and Danger is just kind of making short work of all the X-Men. And then she throws a spike through the middle of Kitty and Colossus, like impales them both. Which makes no sense when you get to later in this book. No, the whole thing is, is weirdly ridiculous. Uh, It is supposed to be a bad moment. We, we learn in a, like an issue or two that Colossus saving Kitty was a bad thing for reasons. Um, But they are, they're clearly impaled and then Wolverine is stomped down and, Emma lets herself get punched and danger heads off to fight Charles Xavier. And, and she does, but then Charles Xavier finds a semi truck to attack her with that, that again, the sequence is very, very strange. Yeah. I mean that, well, we get the uh, big splash page at the end of issue 10 of uh, professor X, not looking like professor X at all being like, you've never fought me. Yeah. (laughs) And it's, it's, it's like the fast and furious cation of X Men. It, it was very, it, it was, it was odd. And the next, the, the the whole next two issues that kind of complete this fight is just a lot of a lot of dumb. I mean, it's it's hitting things with cars and then sending danger into an electrical bit, and then the X Men get resurrected ish by one of the healers who uh, it just this whole sequence becomes very strange and we do get this fight between kitty and and colossus which is she's angry that he saved her but then she's also angry because he's not getting close to her and 
she wants him to get close to her, but maybe she doesn't and she's not sure. And it's, it's like, th this is, this, at this point, the relationship has become exhausting by issue 11. Yeah, I, I'm over it. It's, it's as exhausting as a lot of the other relationships in Whedon-esque yeah. uh, things. But, um, Burn but pop. yeah, it's, uh, then we get to the point, you know, Professor X is back. Everyone's happy for, for Professor X is back. And then, we find out that apparently no one cleaned up the giant genocidal sentinel. Yeah. Well, damage control didn't have a uh, visa access to Genosha. So, you know, like um, it's one of those things you read it and you're like, wow, we thought it was really clever, but it turns out it just makes everyone in Marvel look like a fucking idiot. <laughs> exactly <laughs> no exactly i i hate those logical problems like they they this thing wiped out millions of mutants but we're just going to let it hang out in wherever it, i mean just just kind of behind some buildings i guess it was in the water so it kind of comes out of the water and and goes back to killing um because it's been taken over by danger who any number of people i mean there's i'm like even crappy uh, Marvel villains like Machine Smith. If, they, if if he knew this was around, I mean, he could have run amok. Yeah, but like it's everyone knew it existed. It was sure. worldwide news. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like <laughs> wouldn't Professor X have done something about it. Wouldn't like Magneto have just thrown it into the sun? Like it, it really feels like that should have been taken care of. Um, I mean, Magneto's on this island, as I recall. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess. I forget if we know at this point, because the timeline's completely fucked with this book, um, if we know that Magneto's still alive here or not, or I don't know. Well, it, <laughs> you do. I mean, Professor X makes this comment to Danger that, uh, you know, I have a friend, this fight is not his, but he did send out a magnetic pulse to make sure there were no operating systems operating that bring you to life. He shut down everything. So Magneto helped Professor X set up a battleground that involved a semi truck and knocking her into a power lines, but didn't help with the giant murdering genocidal robot that was hanging out in the pond or the fact that you've got a metal robot. I mean, it, I mean, it could have been helpful here. I'm just, just pointing out he, I, he, it's not his fight though. So, you know, screw it. I, I don't know how the genocide of his people isn't his fight. <laughs> Yeah, you know, he he doesn't have strong convictions. There's there's <laughs> I don't know. No, he's just kind of like whatever, man. Like let's just all move on and be in harmony with each other. That's always been Magneto's personality. He <laughs> he, has, he really hasn't ever experienced genocide, so he doesn't know what that yeah. means. He's a real fed sitter. He Magneto. is a fed sitter. <laughs> so they have this fight uh, with danger, uh, and Emma's drawn away for reasons, and then she comes back. Uh, she had to pee, apparently. Uh, and they they have this kind of quippy fight. And in the midst of all this, we learn that, you know, Colossus has learned that Professor X intentionally kept this danger AI prisoner. And that's that's terrible. Yeah, I, I guess. <laughs> I, I guess that's bad. Um, they don't, they don't really go into it in, in enough of a way to like give it an impact. Yeah. Like, uh, professor X, you know, could have like, I don't know why professor X isn't better at explaining himself. No, he's, he's not. And you get this, we are all very disappointed in you, uh, professor and everybody is, is really disgusted with him. But they're acting like this is the first time Professor X has ever done anything slightly dodgy. That he's he's never he's never done something like this before that could be considered wrong. And they all we get this kind of ashamed walk off where the X Men are all like, "Enough with you!" And they they take off. They they scold him, and you know they they fly off into the sunset, leaving Professor X looking sad. And um, and, and that's all we yeah. get of Professor X. Like that's it. <laughs> It is. And, and and yet a couple months later, they will show up in House of M going back to Genosha. And Kitty's like, oh, I felt so bad about how he left it. And she gives him a big hug. And this whole thing just gets wiped away immediately. 
Yeah, it gets wiped away almost as fast as the uh, giant genocidal uh, sentinel <laughs> is uh, tricked into feeling really bad by danger, so it leaves. Yeah, exactly. Um, it's it it feels bad and flies off into space to spend some time alone because it it killed some people. I, I guess it, it felt bad. Yeah, um, <laughs> it, it gains sentience. Uh, Apparently, Danger is able to tell us that it understands what it means to kill 16 million people. And instead of it being so disgusted with itself, it self-destructs. It's like, you know what? I, I'm going to like, I'm just going to take a walk and I'll feel better. I mean, yeah, it, it's, a, it's a weird, these endings all feel kind of soft. Each one of these arcs, by the way, the, the first arc ended with, you have this mutant destroying serum. But that's all right. Uh, we're just going to move on. And we get to this one and it's like we kid, you know, we, we have the danger room mess, but then we're just going to have the robot move on. And that's kind of consistent with each one of these threads. We, we don't there's no the resolution always feel very half assed each time. Yeah. Um, and this next arc might be the most half assed. 